Welcome to the Digital Dudes Podcast. I'm David. I'm Reed. Reed, it's your birthday. <laughs> so it is. <laughs> you yeah. probably didn't think I was going to out you uh, to the public. <laughs> I know you and I are pretty calm, but uh, you I feel like you already outed, uh, what was it, like two or three years ago when Chex Mix gave you the shout out for your birthday because we bought you all that Chex Mix? And yeah. They, yeah, I I nailed down a, a couple bags uh, this weekend. Um, Miranda knew that. That I mean, she's obviously known me longer than anybody. Um, so yeah, a couple of the bold and spicy I took down uh, this weekend, along with you know the twenty plus wings I mentioned uh, in this morning's roundup. So I don't know how my intestines, you know, not to, <laughs> how they're going <laughs> to take the, these last couple of days and the next couple because it's not over. I had some amazing chorizo and egg breakfast tacos that Miranda made this morning. So I may roll into work next time you see me. Yeah. Uh, well, I, uh, we actually were going to buy you like a pallet of Chex Mix before we decided that we wanted to take you to dinner. And then I was like, I actually think Miranda was like, against Chex Mix for Reed. I think she was trying to get him off of it. So <laughs> we decided not to go the Chex Mix route uh, on this one. But, you know, it does bring more my heart that you are still j- diving into the bold and spicy. Yeah. Well, she thanks you. Believe me. She has to wear like a shield every time I eat that stuff. Uh, it's it's a little pungent. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, on today's episode, I know you want to get out of here uh, uh, so you can go hit the birthday celebrations. But uh, we talked to Robert uh, Turnbull from BetterBot. And we must have been 20 minutes into the conversation before we actually explained what BetterBot is. But in a way, I feel like it doesn't need any explaining what BetterBot is because I feel like everyone knows it. it as he says, it is the uh, most prolific bot in the industry. At the same time, though, it's like did it did surprise me uh, when I recently learned that they're just a couple of years old at this point because I feel like they've been around forever. So they've done a remarkable job, like quickly getting traction and respect in the industry. Um, yeah, so I think it's a really fun episode. Yeah, it is. Robert's great. He's got that amazing voice too, which, you know, you'll hear here in a few, few seconds if you continue to listen. But, um, you know, the beauty of BetterBot to me, and I remember, uh, I guess flirting with this, uh, tagline for, for Digible and for Fiona a while back, but is he does, he's able to simplify a fairly complicated technology. I mean, people, I think, don't appreciate it. And he gets at that a little bit. You, you've always brought up that locksmith example, but, um, you know, it, it would seem the things that he's doing and that they certainly have planned are, are very complex, but it, it comes off as remarkably simple and that's not easy to pull off. So I think that's one of the, the cooler things about his company and, and the platform they've, they've built. Yeah. It's what I also think is, um, I said something is he, every time I talk to him, he drops a lot of stats. So I didn't, um, maybe because I've heard them now, I, I didn't have him go into as many stats, but I liked what he said today where he said at first they started as a natural language generation platform. So just open-ended questions and bot responding. And they found that it was inaccurate 30% of the time. And so they scrapped that and went to a, as he called a guided conversation, which to me is a little bit of a mix, right? Like you type a question and then it kind of gives you a couple of different things to, to pick from. Uh, but the fact that he's saying like 30%, of the time being incorrect is not good enough. Like we need it to be 1% of the time is what he said. And I thought that speaks volumes because a lot of folks would be like, you know, 70% is pretty good. Sometimes I, as the example I give during the episode, like sometimes I Google something and I have to try re-Googling again or again before I get what I want, right? So I feel like a lot of people would have gone to the market as he, you know, at the NLG thing and he decided it wasn't good enough. So definitely think he's thinking, I don't know, long-term about the best customer experience. And where I was getting to is the simplification. It's like, it does feel like when you experience better about, you're like, oh, this is simple. We, you know, I could build this, let's say, but you, you can't, it's just really hard. So they can't get knocked off. They make it seem so simple. I'm sure if other companies, when they have tried, I'm sure some have tried and haven't been able to do it. It just, it's a way more complex than you would have uh, just figured at first, first glance. Yeah, totally. Well, the other uh, thing I I asked him and uh, I didn't, I guess, ask him to weight it as far as his decision on NLP, but was the fair housing. Like, um, you know, we, we know the pressure that you feel in running organic social for a property. It's their brand. They're very sensitive to, to how, you know, they're portrayed and, you know, how we respond to, to comments and questions, et cetera. When you do that with, you know, technology, it would seem you're, 
I mean, that's scary. And, and I don't mean that it's not something that, you know, is coming or that I would support, but, um, you know, he just said that was one of the, the things that was a concern for the NLP is, is you can totally go off the rails and end up, you know, causing a lawsuit. And so I think until it does feel closer to that 99%, which is a pretty ambitious like goal, but, um, that would be one of my bigger concerns. Yeah. Um, couple stories about that, like the, the AI Twitter bot that people put out there and was just started as a love bot and then ended up as a, as a hate bot basically right. within like 36 right. hours. Then there's another one, Reed, I was telling you, um, I don't know, a couple months ago about, um, Elon Musk's, uh, AI company that he got out of later, but it's open AI, open AI just does research on AI and he started to distance himself from it because he didn't want to be seen as a conflict of interest, but they just released a natural language uh, generation and processing model called GTP3. And it's like the most advanced. It was trained on basically the entirety of the internet. You can ask it any language-based question and it will return a response to you. But it's so, it's, it's so smart that it will make, sometimes it will make jokes back to you instead of like, tell, instead of giving you the answer, it like almost has a personality where it will like, you know, Hey, uh, what's a living thing. And then it just like, throws you a, a random ass thing like instead uh because it just it it wants to have fun and you ask them like why did you say that that's not true and they're like i was joking it's like okay but gtp3 unfortunately because it's it's got this like jokester or possible jokester personality to it uh they were testing it on like as a way to to help people with like mental uh issues or in illness and uh and uh, diagnosis and somebody was like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling sick. I, I have a cough. My chest hurts. And, and GTP3 said, why don't you kill yourself? Just like joked back to the, to the test audience. And it thought it was funny, but its number one command is not to, not to harm people, right? But you have like, when you have this AI thing, it can just go off the rails and cause some real problems. So being that this thing was trained on the entirety of the internet, uh, it, was, it was trained on like, I think it was like 300 billion different like conversations or something. Nothing's even come close. And it decides to make jokes uh, like that. I can't imagine when we would feel comfortable running that for, uh, with fair housing, uh, you know, concerns in mind. Totally, man. That's a crazy freaking example. Um, you know, sarcasm is, is the dominant, you know, humor in the Western world. I mean, it, it really, you know, of course uh, the Brits and, you know, I wish Isabel was on for a second to, to give her a little bit of crap, but, um, or credit, credit, not crap. Uh, you know, they say that they, they were the ones that birthed that. But my point here is how do you train a bot on sarcasm, you know, like, and that's a big part of personality, right? So, uh, yeah, it's super fascinating to see how that plays out um, because you you do introduce all sorts of liabilities and risk if you try to create a personality that goes beyond like Alexa. When my girls, because they do this, they're like, hey, tell us a joke. It's like, why did the chicken cross the road? That's the <laughs> level of humor that Alexa brings. Um, so, yeah, not to digress too much, but uh, it is fascinating. It, it's one of the things that Robert uh, may or may not be thinking about. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this was a, a really fun conversation with Robert. I thought he was super open when on things that he didn't necessarily have to be. Uh, and I think, it, you know, if you have any interest in the industry, we touch a lot of different things from uh, Reed asks about CoStar not being able to purchase RentPath uh, and his opinions on that and, and among other things. So I think it's a fun episode and you guys should should stay tuned. No doubt. Yeah. Okay, we're here with Robert Turnbull. He's a co-founder of BetterBot. And Robert, you've been in the industry for some time. So I think most folks that have been in for more than 18 months probably have come across you or one of your companies. But why don't you give us a little bit of your background and uh, how you got to where you are today? And you just gave us a teaser for your thing tomorrow, but why bots, why now? So I had to sl slide that in there, but give us your background and how you got here. Yeah, so like a lot of people in multifamily, I got here by mistake. Um, I 
Uh, once you're in, you just, you can't get out. And I got in 22 years ago. Some partners and I started apartmentguide.com in 1999. It was uh, an interesting time because we're trying to convince people back then that I swear the internet's going to change the way consumers look for apartments. And I got laughed out of a few rooms from 1999 to 2003. And in 2003, the light bulbs went off and everyone went, oh my gosh, this is really going to change everything. So that was apartmentguide.com. I ran that for some time. And then we went out and created rentals.com, which is the largest single unit business. Um, and then realestate.com. We then started RentWiki, which became Rent Advisor, sold to Apartment List. And then I tried to leave for about eight minutes. <laughs> and I went to a live person, which is the largest chat company in the world uh, for chat and consumers. While I was there, I really learned an awful lot about bot technologies worldwide with some of the biggest and best, IBM Watson, Get Jenny, Chat for Robotify. Um, and so I found my way back into multifamily with bot technology, which was really kind of coming into its own or the beginning stages. And so our timing with the bot was really uh, unique and because we weren't too far behind. We weren't too far ahead. We were right on that that cusp of people ready to adopt it in our industry. So that's the 22 years of me and multifamily. Um, I'm going to back up a second. Uh, so four years of pain, it sounds like, at Apartment Guide from 99 to 2003. So yeah. first first question, what changed in 2003? Like what what's your thought on, on that? Yeah, I think you've got a multifamily look, if, if we're being honest, is about five years behind the rest of the world. Um, and so while the rest of the world was adopting the internet commerce, e-commerce and internet, uh, you know, guided search and all that, <clears throat> we were just five years behind. And so uh, right around back then, it was the guidebooks, right? So the guidebooks were in all the racks in the stores. Um, and that was the way to find your next apartment. But when we can consolidate all that content, put it at your fingertips, and the really what changed it for the industry is the leads that they were getting was like, wow, we're getting this stuff so quickly and we're getting so many and they seem to be converting so well, well, then it made sense that we need to start getting into the internet. And, um, and it's usually the consign wherever the renters and consumers are, eventually we find our way there too. So Robert, I'm going to put you back in your ILS shoes for a second. Uh -oh. If um, I understand if I, if I was in the apartment guide book and the book was at seven 11, I'm going to have to give you 30 days of lead time for me to make that issue. Why do you make people sign a 12-month online contract? Oh, back then? No, well, now. I'm just saying, think about it. Oh, like, what do you know. <laughs> what do you, well, a, not at BetterBot, like, right? But I mean, in the ILS world. I'm sort of joking, right? Because like the books, oh, yeah. like when Reed and I were in the Yellow Pages, we had to make people sign an annual agreement, but it's because it's the Yellow Pages, right? You drop the book once a year. So it makes sense in the guidebook that you'd have to sign like a little bit ahead of time, but can you believe that they've gotten people to go from signing up for one guidebook a month or a quarter or something to now where you're signing an online agreement for 12 months? I, I, I'm stunned. Are, are people doing that today? I don't even know that you can get anyone to sign a 12 month agreement for anything today in multifamily. Oh, well, um, buckle up. go back and start an ILS, man. <laughs> I say read. I mean, it's probably six out of 10 people we talk to are signing annuals. It is yeah. completely, and I'm just going to put that out as someone who's who's run ILSs for years. I don't think you, I don't think you can get away with that. You shouldn't be able to. Not in today's not in today's commerce. So my humble opinion. Yeah. Well, I mean, we agree a hundred percent. CoStar is still fairly effective with that. You know, they say that they'll let you maneuver some things around as long as you stay at a current spend. But we've heard different things from different people, and a lot of it, of course, depends on your buying power. Um, but I had heard that Apartment Guide was showing more flexibility uh, over the last few years. I feel like we're talking to like a, a famous artist that like wants to talk about his new music, and we want to like talk about like <laughs> you know the good old hits. Uh, I really but, don't mind uh, talking about it. I'm we'll we'll try to behave <laughs> and keep the conversation focused on the bots, but I do no, at no, some no. point want to squeeze a few more in about Apartment Guide. But um, anyways, it's it's a heck of a background. One other thing I want to note is David a couple uh, a couple casts ago mentioned you know that I have the radio voice. Um, now we know what a real radio voice voice sounds like. Um, so <laughs> I'm jealous, envy, envious of Robert here. Uh, he gave us a quick preview. I'm going to put you on the spot. Give give us one more quick uh, voiceover uh, from your your days in, in radio. Oh my gosh! 
Um, so I'll do the one from, from Florida State uh, Radio <clears throat> on V89, your voice of choice, Florida State University Radio. Of course, oh, I've, 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 been on the, I've been on calls for six hours straight. <laughs> I'm actually not, not where it normally is. That is a thing uh, of beauty. It really is, man. Uh, uh, thank you. It. Thank you. Yeah, takes me back. All right. <laughs> sorry, sorry for the detour. Um, oh, my. You'll, there'll be a few of these, I'm sure. Yeah, Bring pretty Bring free it. flowing. So, Robert, let's say you you tried to get out of uh, out of apartments for eight minutes. You said, um, and then you saw that the power of bots. And I'm sure being in the industry so long, you're like, shoot, I gotta. This would just apply so well, right? So, how did you? Um, just curious for you to pull back the curtain a little bit. You decided to found another company, which is a big <laughs> decision. I'm sure in your head, you're thinking like, shoot, I'm now this is an, at least a five year journey as you go off to do that. In what uh, besides that, what you saw, what was happening in other industries with bots, is there anything else that was that captured your attention as far as like, yes, I want to, I want to stay in multifamily. I want to, I'm going to put another five years in, and I'm going to choose bots as it because I'm sure you've had a dozen ideas. So, I guess, yes. yeah, the why bots, why now for you? Um, okay, so I will say that when I was at Live Person and we started working with trying to get chat, let's understand first of all, the consumer wants information now. Right. And they want inf people at their fingertips, quite literally at their fingertips. And so I thought conceptually chat is going to be really good because a renter can, can hit someone at the property. And other than a phone call or email, they can chat with them. So it sounds great. So we tried to get chat into multifamily and we realized inherently there's just a flaw. People at the properties aren't available. There's no one on the other end. And so when they said, oh, well, some people have uh, call centers. Uh, in which they use chat centers, but we were realizing there's still a five to seven minute connection time. Uh, the prop, they simply don't know as much information as the people on the property. And there was this huge disconnect with chat. And I'm like, well, if only I could figure out a way for someone to automatically be on the other end, answering questions up front, voila, let's get bots. So actually when we built better bot, we went into the other spaces, real estate, we went into builder space. And I sat there and I thought, uh oh, I think I'm going to end up back in multifamily because this is actually exactly the product that I think multifamily is looking for instead of chat because chat just wasn't working. And and so, but I don't know why. I think maybe because I was been in it, I had been in it for so many years that I did it begrudgingly because I love this industry. And I came back in and five minutes back in, I was like, I just, I just love this industry. I'm going to be in it. It's really a family. Uh, folks know folks here. Uh, we look out for each other. And um and so it's a it's a it's a close knit group, and um, it's and it's fun because you're getting a product out to folks. That they're actually seeing some benefit at the same time. So that's what kind of got me back in. Yeah, well, it sounds like you don't regret it, uh, Reed. I don't know if you're picking up on this, but I know you had dreams at one point about getting into research and into cannabis. But I guess now, like you can take cannabis off the table. <laughs> sounds like you're stuck in apartments. Yeah, I yeah. guess so. I don't want people to read that the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we're in Colorado and, you know, I'm an opportunist at heart. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of business people taking a look at the, that industry. But, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a while before I, I, I make a run at that one. And I'm well, happy hey, to do it. We could join forces instead of better bot. We could do better pot. There you go. <laughs> do, 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 do you want to do that? <laughs> Very marketable coming from, there you coming go, from a natural sales guy for we sure. that for it. Well, the thing I'll say about multifamily, since you mentioned it, it, it is an amazing industry and it, it does feel very much like family and, and we're newcomers, all things considered, uh, you know, David's been in it a little bit longer than myself, but now digital is about to hit four years. And that's, that's unusual to have that kind of, uh, welcoming, if you will, um, you know, to a relative outsider, um, that, you know, there's plenty of, I feel, feel like industries that are very tight knit, you know, kind of incestuous, if you will, but they, they're also very difficult to crack. And I think most in multifamily will at least give you a shot. You know, it's not like talk to the hand and yourself include, included, Robert. I mean, you, you were very quick to welcome us in and talk to us back a couple of years ago in AIM. And that's generally been our experience, which has been wonderful. You know, just love the clients, love, you know, all, all the change that's happening. I, I think you were almost being generous with the five years. I think now with COVID, we're only five years behind, <laughs> but pre-COVID, I think it was more like 10 years. So but it's I fun agree. to be a part of that change, you know, affecting change is, is a big part of why we're in it, uh, you know, in the first place. So, yeah. And I always say, if I'm not pacing the hallways at least once or twice a day, trying to solve a problem, 
uh, that is forward thinking, then I'm I'm in the wrong place. Um, and, and so that's what I enjoy about being in forward looking products and solutions. And, and that's where I get my, you know, my satisfaction. Uh, sometimes you can be too far ahead. I've been there too. And you got to well, play catch up. Well, let me ask, um, you know, w- w- for me, like when we first started talking to you and, and then a couple conversations you had with David that I wasn't privy to, but it it's surprised me that it took this long, um, as you mentioned, the five years, but you know, that chat or bots um, weren't part of multifamily sooner uh, and that, you know, this discovery you're kind of pointing to as far as people not being available or on the other end of the line, it just seems like operators have grappled with that for a while. So it's still surprising me. Um, I'm happy for you and, you know, happy we're getting to work together because uh, I think it's a great, you know, technology, if you will, you know, and I'll say evolution of bots that you've, you've brought to the market. But I'm still surprised that there was this kind of opening and clearly you guys are taking off, which is great. But did, did it surprise you that somebody hadn't kind of, uh, you know, done a land grab on this earlier? Well, oh, good question. Um, when I looked back into multifamily and I was thinking about bots, uh, I always, and first of all, let me be very clear. I admire anybody who comes out with a new product and solutions. So this is in no way, shape or form disparaging anybody. Um, so the products that were out there when we came in about three years ago, more power to them. You know, they, they're, they're, they're paving the way for other folks. They were using technologies that we have proven aren't as effective. And, and I get it. Sometimes when you adopt real early, you kind of adhere to that solution. And I'm referring to natural language processing. NLP is the super cool toy. It's the AI. It's the, you know, the, the, the fun thing, but it doesn't work. It's not built yet. It's five years away from being effective, maybe three. And so when I saw that, um, we actually built a natural language processing engine. It's the biggest in the industry using multifamily lexicons and language, totally proprietary, and it didn't work. Uh, Three out of 10 times it was failing. And so uh, we decided to move towards what we call guided conversation when we did that, that's when we really started to differentiate ourselves from the folks coming in. And the results were so good after we made that switch, um, the clients started taking notice. And that's when anytime you can get data back to a client and they go, wow, this thing's really working. That's when you start to see it take off. So it was a tough decision we made early on, but it was the right decision. Um, we walked away from NLP. Uh, in favor of guided conversation. And that is what has enabled us to grow much faster than we thought. We're at 115 management companies. Last year, we did 4 million conversations, just our second full year. Uh, half a million handoffs are just basically to, to leasing staff and quarter of a million appointments. Um, so so the growth makes us, that makes us the, the, the single largest bot in all of multifamily. So, yeah, I've, I've, you know, um, it, it, what's the last thing I'll say to that is I think for some of the bigger companies, they're waiting to see what happens. We come out, we say, hey, there really is a business in this. And suddenly everyone else starts piling on. These guys have kind of proven it better, but there's a business for this. So that's why you're seeing all these other bots coming out, I think, right now. Well, I think yeah. you probably just gave Reed like three or four questions because I know I have them. But before we miss out here, I, I realize we never really identified what is the difference between you guys and others? So maybe if you would give us, Robert, like a past, present, and future of, I'll do air quotes around bots. <laughs> and then like, where does better bot fit into that? Like, uh, just give us kind of the the, the elevator pitch. So past, past yeah. maybe past and present, at least, I'm sure we'll get the future, but, and then where better bot fits in. Yeah, no, that's a, well, that's a really interesting question because in the past, we recall what we call smart forms. So you put something in and then it kind of has certain things and it'll, it'll, it'll bring you something back. It's not really a, bot, it's more just rules-based, right? And then so you enter and you get certain options. Um, the next generation then became after smart form really became, and smart forms pop out to other things. So if you click on it, it may open up another page. Um, and then, so then you get into the NLP, which is the most recent natural language processing. Again, really super cool, just doesn't work. It just breaks too many times. Um, and so that's the, the next generation where, where we're moving, if you look at the really big bot companies, Drift, Intercom, they're all have now moved to guided conversation because they realized it's called dumb like a fox. You dumb it down a little bit, 
But by doing that, it, it, the results are so much better. Consumers get a better experience. So the, the results are better. So we're a guided conversation today. We are where some folks in the other industry, we were two years ago where they are. They're still learning. But part of that's because they're focusing on other products that they have. And the bot's kind of a me too or an add-on. All we do is bots. So that's why we can move at lightning pace in bot technology. I think the future is we're going to eventually end up at natural language processing. I do believe that is the future. It's just not today. We're about three years away from that happening. So that's the future state, I think, of bot technology. Got it. And then the main other folks you go up against, and then I'll pass it back to Reed for those four questions I'm sure he got. But who who would you say you guys go up against the most? Because I think that'll help people frame like what other widgets, I guess, you're compared to, if, if you will. Because a bot, yeah, a bot could be a lot of things. Well, it, that's exactly right. Um, people that we get compared to that we don't compete with, an example would be uh, maybe like a Perk. Uh, Perk is a lead gen solution. It, it's not a bot solution. And Perk will tell you that. Um, so people kind of say, oh, you're like Perk. We're actually nothing like Perk. We manage conversations uh, on multiple plat- places, not just a website. Um, and so then they'll say, well, meet Elise. Well, meet Elise actually does natural language processing for email and text. We don't do that. Um, so we actually partnered with Middle East. So we partner with them. We don't compete with them. Uh, the ones that we do in the knock sometimes comes up. They have the knock, you know, they call doorway. It really is more of a smart form. Um, and, you know, and it ties in nicely with, with knock. It is not a bot experience, but it is a, you know, it is an experience. And then of the true bots that are out there that do use natural language, I would say Rentron was one of the first to res page. Um, and, you know, they've, they've had some good progress. Um, anyone home came out with a bot option. Uh, Mike Mueller's Leasehawk, Ace. Um, so each each has some advantages and disadvantages if you're to go down. But those are the few that I think that I come across from time to time. Yeah, cool. All right, Reed. Sorry, I had to get the setup because I realized we didn't go into what, what the heck they do. So I'll let you go. No, back. no problem. No, those are obviously important questions. So you mentioned... Um, several times NLP versus guided conversations, but I didn't catch the distinction between the two. Oh, um, okay. So natural languages, I go in and I type, hi, I'm looking for a four bedroom, two bath, blah, 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 right? The bot then tries to interpret on the sentence structure and keywords what really you're asking for. Um, so I'll use a better example. I have a 50 pound Rottweiler. Can, can it come there and live there? Rottweiler. Okay, must be asking for pets. Then responds and says, "Hey, our pet policy is the following." It wasn't exactly, but it was close, right? So it's using natural language and it's trying to figure out the sentence structure by then providing a sentence back. Um, and again, when it works, it's actually pretty cool. I I like it. It just breaks too often because we talk and in, in, we intone in so many different ways with nuance. I could say the four same four words. Did you buy that? And depending on what word I emphasize, has this four entirely different meanings, and that's the that's the English language. Guided conversations understands probably where you're looking based on what you've clicked on, what you probably want, and puts up prompts, and then guides you very quickly through the prompts. Um, and then so it's called guided conversation. The AI component knows where you've been and where you likely want to go next, and then serves up the relevant content. It reminded me, sorry, of like, you know, on Google, like people think like NLP, it's been around for years. It should just, it should just work. Right. But uh, Google is basically that, right. You type in a question to Google and it gives you a page of 10 results back or more. Right. And how often do you click on the Google? I'm feeling lucky and go to the first page. It return never. Right. You, you like, you always want to see all the results and look Great at point. them and then click because if Google can't do NLP good enough yet, then you know, why should any of the rest of us be trying to use it? I guess for our business is my, my point, but. That's a great point, David. That's a really good point. That's why I, I give you option. Yep. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the incredible growth, uh, which, you know, again, we congratulate you. I'm wondering, um, is that in all kind of segments? Uh, is it more upstream? Is it, you know, mom and pops? Like uh, what is the makeup um, of all this growth? Yeah, so we're predominantly with the, you know, the typical property management companies that you see in our industry from 20, you know, communities to 3,000 communities. And we work with the, you know, the largest, the five largest uh, as well. Uh, we we do have a conventional 
multifamily, which is usually 75 units or above. Um, and But we actually just launched a student version. So it searches by the bed, by the semester. Uh, that's a big market that's underserved. So we actually created a student bot. Um, affordable is another one, especially with the pandemic and everything happening right now. The affordable is going to be oh, inundated. Uh, in these next year to two years. So we built in an affordable version. It actually looks at household incomes, does all that kind of stuff and pre-qualifies and also helps with list management. Uh, so we're launching that, actually launched that this month uh, here in February. And then um, we will be getting into single unit uh, where you have the boutique properties of 30 units. You may not have availability, but I have 20 buildings with 10 units or I have a thousand properties that are a single unit, like a condo, a town home. So we're going to actually, we're building out the single unit bot, which is an entirely different type. What's interesting when we get into single unit, we can service what we call the multi-bot back in multifamily. So you have owner groups that have maybe 10 properties and four of them happen to be right near each other. Well, wouldn't that be kind of cool if the agent, the bot, said, hey, I don't have that floor plan available, but right a mile down the road, I do have one available. Would you like to check out my sister property? That requires an entirely different database that we're actually the only one that I'm aware of that's structured to do that. So we're building out the single unit slash um, owner bot here in the uh, this next uh, three months. Super cool. And that would line up well. I mean, David, you know, could speak to it even more than I can, but just all the clients we have that are looking to build kind of their own regional ILSs. Um, and if they had a bot that supported, you know, the the sister properties, um, that would be a gem for them, I'm sure. We got to talk. I like that idea of regional ILS because you could do that with the bot. Yeah, Amazing. that's awesome. Well, I'll let David weigh in on that second, but I had one other question that ties back to David asking kind of about the U USP uh, for better bot, we, we talk all the time with our technology, um, and a lot of the, you know, books you read, you know, especially, uh, with, with tech founders about that moat, you know, like trying to, to build up some distance. And so you in, inevitably are garnering a lot of attention, um, knockoffs, no, no shot at knock. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, how are you thinking about that? Uh, you know, some of the things, uh, you know, that, you know, we talk about is how does it, how does a product become more valuable over time? And I don't know if that is something, you know, that is kind of built into, to your vision or what already exists today, but I just, you know, didn't know if, yes, we gather information, but you know, they're all so independent. Like, you know, we talk about snowflakes, uh, thumbprints, meaning each conversation is its own. So does, does the product get more valuable over time for properties? Yeah, so um, let's look at it this way. If you aren't reinventing yourself in the industry and your product and constantly improving it, you will be overtaken. The good news about bot technology is if someone else is, you, you, if they're using a different bot and we come along, man, switching out a bot's easy. It's one line of code and it takes all of 60 seconds. That's the good news. The bad news is I can be replaced in 60 seconds too. Um, so I have to create such a value around what we're doing that they don't want to. So how do we do that? Well, the bot, our bot can be put on a property website, but it was the only one that's designed to actually be distributed to Google My Business, which is and, and Instagram and Facebook, Facebook Marketplace, Yelp, and the list goes on and on. So wherever a consumer prospective renter can find that property, the bot can actually live there and answer questions 24 seven, 365. Now you talk about stickiness. If the bots on your property website and on GMB and Yelp and, 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 now it's a little hard to replace us because we're so baked in and it's actually working really well. Google My Business and for some of our properties represents 40% of the conversations happening. And so GMB is just killing it. Um, and when you see the bot working at 3 a.m., midnight, 5 a.m., having conversations on Google My Business, uh, now, you're, now you're starting to get some stickiness. We are getting into what we call WIP, Web Lead Intercept Protocol, where we can actually start intercepting leads coming through from various ILSs and responding and converting those into synchronous bot conversations instead of just leads going into a CRM. Now we're starting to create additional value where we're baking ourselves into the processes. And suddenly we're not just a bot on your property website, we're an integral part of your marketing solution. And that's where we are with BetterBot and where we're going. Very cool, very smart. Well, David, did you want to add anything on the, uh, 
on the regionals? Or? Yeah, not so much the regional. I think that is a, a growing movement, though. So it's interesting that you guys are, if you will, get it going, heading. It will be possible to go that direction. So we can talk offline about some of that, Robert. Um, but I'm curious about the uh, the moat, because as Reed was saying, and, and I think you started to say at the beginning, Robert, like people are building their bots, if you will, like on other people's technology. Reed and I talk about this a lot, right? Do you want to be a platform or do you want to be a product, right? Because you'll have like the Amazon bot or the Google bot, or as you said, the the Watson bot that you use, that people will use as the framework and then and then add their magic sauce on top. So whatever you're comfortable sharing, I'm curious about how you think about those technologies and those platforms. Because I my argument for you would be one, like, yeah, okay, you guys may be built on one of those other technologies, but you still have to like mold it, if you will, to how, how we'll work best. And I don't think someone could come along and just rip uh, rip um, rip you off like that quickly because of all the work you guys must have put into the, the to the framework about how you're building on top of a platform. But I'm curious if you would just talk a little bit about that technology, and then adding to that, you talk about at the beginning apartments are kind of five years behind. Uh, you guys, it's a it's remarkable what you have done in just two years or, or in change at BetterBot. So I'm curious uh, also on that technology side, what keeps you up at night? Because it sounds like you're saying NLP will become a thing, but what has you freaked the hell out when it comes to what you guys are doing? Because I think it's super cool, but as as we know, there can be a tectonic shift and all of a sudden it's like, well, this doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the first part of your question, um, we used, you know, the, um, the the Google solution, Alexa, when we first actually four years ago. And what we learned very quickly is they don't understand multifamily. It's an entirely different lexicon, an entirely different language. So we quickly went away from that. So, so some of my friends and who've built bots in the industry said, oh, bots are easy. I can build it in two seconds. It's not that hard. I just plug into Alexa. I'm like, hey, good luck with that. It's not going to work. And you got to do a lot of training. So they're into that now. We're well beyond it. So then we said, well, let's build our own. Let's build our own solution with our own language and lexicons. Um, and, and then, of course, we realized, again, as I said, the NLP was simply doesn't work. Now, even though we use guided conversation, we still have so many queries where people will type something in, like, hey, do you have a covered parking spot? So we're collecting in our four million conversations all sorts of patterns, all sorts of natural language. And we have an engine that's running in the background that's watching all of this. So when the time is right, and we will not introduce natural language processing until we're at 99% success rate. We'll allow for 1% failure, but we're not there yet. And we have the biggest engine so far. So when that time comes and we're being prepared, so the right hand's talking guided conversation, the left hand is very, very poignantly watching all of this happening. We will be the first to launch, launch the natural language processing, but the right way, um, not using the solutions that are out there today. Um, so that does keep me up, but we, I, I, I generally had a good idea Idea of how to look a year, two, three year, years in the future. And so where others are tactically looking at today in our company, my job is to look one, two, and three years in the future and make sure that we, we miss those landmines and in fact do the opposite, but capitalize on those opportunities when they happen. So yeah, it keeps me up and that's my job is to make sure that I'm, I'm looking at the future. Yeah. Well, Reed and I have the same conversation. We're constantly up in the air and then on the ground and back up again. Um, Reed, I feel like, is this your time to pitch your uh, personal shopping assistant bot idea? <laughs> oh, I love that idea. I know you're going with that. Well, it's not by any stretch <laughs> fully baked or crystallized. It's just... You know, I, I frequently, as we, David's just been pressing you a little bit about the vision and the future, like we'll do that, whether it's interviewing people at Digital, you know, we're trying to figure out if they're themselves kind of thought leaders and, and thinking ahead. But very much for us, as you said, it's your job to think about the future and obviously me, David's as well. And so we talk in, in terms of like 20 or 30 years just to try and get people to like realize we're, we're not looking at, you know, 2022 and see how people respond to that. And so somewhere in one of these conversations that David and I had, we, we talked about kind of the, the apartment locators versus the ILSs versus virtual assistants slash, slash chats. And maybe it's an easy thing for me to say, not an easy thing to do, but is can you fuse kind of all of that together? And um, with very advanced NLP, create um, kind of a personal assistant, you know, locator, if you will. So it's like, I'm not going to go hire a locator. I'm just going to have one that I can speak to in my phone. 
I'll have access to to the inventory, you know, with all the uh, self guided tours, and I'll talk to it about what I really like when I'm on site. So in real time, you know, I really dig these counters. Oh well, there's a few more down the street, you know, that kind of stuff. Where all these like technologies that are really siloed start to come together into one ultimate experience. But mm -hmm. I I know that's you know quite a ways down the road, but that's what he's referring to. It's it's not as far down the road as you may think. Um, I this is um, this is the part where I say BetterBot's building a Frankenstein in the basement, and um, and that's about as far as I can talk about that. But it is germane to what you just said, and we definitely need to talk. <laughs> well, very uh, cool. If I had any money under the couch to invest, Robert, I uh, yeah, that's funny. Knowing that you're uh, you got a Frankenstein in the works, I'm, that's exciting to hear. We have, we have Frankenstein, and I think that those who are prognosticators forward-looking in our industry, those of us, um, a friend of mine, uh, Sina, um, he's uh, Sina Shaku, he, he refers to guys like me and himself as the, the industry gray hairs um, who've been around trying to reinvent stuff. And we all are kind of going down a very similar path with regard to how consumers are ingesting data today and tomorrow. Your idea around having a personal shopper is not that far away from from actually happening, and so um, it's exciting stuff. And that's and that's where look if we stay with what we're doing today, a year or two, uh, we'll become just another uh, kind of a cool bot. That's not where I want to be in two or three years from now. Uh, we want to be more akin to what you just described. Very cool. Shopper. Well, David, I can't remember the. Uh, it was another founder. Um... I feel terrible. I think his name was Jason from uh, up in Chicago that we talked to that was part of this locating, but, but, it, but it wasn't a tech platform. And that was one of the questions we asked him is, do you think that locators are going to be around in 30 years? I mean, again, trying to use kind of extreme terms, like a few decades from now, are we even going to see locators? He still thinks so and likens it to a lot of different, you know, you hear retailers talking about the experience, which I don't dismiss. Um, but it seems like there, there's a, uh, uh, a clear opportunity. And obviously you agree, Robert, for, for something like this to happen sooner than later. And the funny thing about this, not to you know go off on a tangent, but Dave and I both said when we were living in apartments, we never even thought about getting a locator. And so that's one of the problems for locators is they don't do a good job of marketing themselves. But if you were to have a personal assistant that we're referring to, a Frankenstein, I still love that. Uh, I would almost maybe want to market market it with that way. You get people's attention. But that that's that's highly marketable and has a chance to really get widespread adoption. Whereas, you know, I mean, most people that get apartments don't even it's not like, you know, single family. They don't think, hey, I need somebody to walk me through the process. But with the advent of all this new technology, uh, it it. It's going to be, I think, definitely stars are going to align here pretty quickly. Yeah, it, you know, interesting um, with regard to realtors, uh, when you know, when uh, Zillow and all the big ILSs for for resale homes came out and have been coming out for quite some time, realtors really had to reinvent themselves. Um, that you don't need to go to a realtor anymore to find content. I can find that now if I want. What they did is they provided additional services and benefits, uh, so really kind of an assistant to you. Locators in the industry have not made that change. Uh, they have kept a very old model, and this is why you just don't see them around nearly as much anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not providing that that service that the realtor is doing. Uh, I still use realtors, love realtors. Um, they do a really great, they take a lot of work off um, for, for me. Uh, the locators are not doing that. And, um, and quite frankly, there's just not as much money in it either anymore. Uh, technology yeah. has reduced that cost. Uh, where it's still it's still there for a realtor, but not necessarily for a locator. Yeah. David, can I squeeze another one in here? Um, you mentioned the the learnings, you know, insights uh, that's setting you up potentially for a great NLP product, you know, in a, a few years, whatever, maybe in one year, I don't know. But um, what other insights are you starting to discover, or do you see as opportunities like with bots? What's coming back? It seems like you just have a trove of like stuff to bring back to a property as far as. Um, how they should be thinking about closing. So it's like all these insights we're capturing, you should be passing on these things to your your on-site team. You should be reverse engineering some of your marketing campaigns or optimizing them based on what we're seeing with GMB or whether it's Instagram. 
and you know, Robert, obviously we, we have a digital recommendation engine um, that we're excited to, you know, be partnering with uh, BetterBot to see how it informs our technology. But uh, just if you don't mind, talk a few minutes about the kind of va value add you get, um, you know, from the data that's coming back. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of data uh, in so many different ways in terms of referring stores. Let me, let me pick one example. The bot sits on a property website. It sees all the, the 32 places that the website got traffic from. So it's not just seeing that. It's actually figuring out, well, that's interesting because this source sent me a lot of traffic, says the bot. Um, but none of it really seemed to engage much. But this other marketing source didn't send as much. But wow, did it ever engage. Well, what does that tell me? That tells me this referring source, all things being equal, is sending me much better traffic. It's sending me better stuff that's engaged. So whatever product or source that is, and trust me, I see it every day. So I can tell you some that are better than others, but I won't, I won't do that because I don't want to upset anybody. So, um, but it's, it's really fascinating because the bots engaging and we use a proprietary algorithm that basically goes in and says, uh, based on their behavior, when they came in, we noticed that, um, uh, that this is your, their best channel for volume. This is your best converting and this is your best overall channel. Now, where it's interesting with Fiona and your product is you guys take it to a whole other level, <laughs> like your data and recommendation engines. So we're basically collecting data, tweaking some knowledge and then handing it off to folks like you who can go in and make actually specific recommendations. So you look at the data that we're providing on that side, handing off to you guys who can make recommendations. You've got a really nice, powerful match there for marketing executives. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that the multi-touch attribution, how many times, it's even got an initial, MTA, like this MTA now, it said so much, the renter's journey. Well, it's a funny thing when the bot's sitting on Yelp and it's sitting on Google My Business and your property website and responding to texts and sending emails, it actually sees where it came in at timestamps, that it knows where the journey was and which source actually provided the highest value. So why is it I'm getting tons of interactions or, or traffic maybe from one source, but they got to this source and this is the one that converted into appointment and ultimately became a lease. We believe we can solve the multi-touch attribution renter's journey um, with using a bot, but it's only half the battle. What do you do with that now? And that's where I think partnering with an, an engine and a company like yourself, where you can do the analysis and make recommendations is a, is a nice one-two combination. Um, Robert, the curious, you mentioned renter's journey. Um, where, where do you think a bot fits in? So for example, like I know you have lots of data, so I, meaning you have lots of stats you throw at me all the time. So maybe you have a stat for this or don't, but what we've typically seen is that it's a 32 day leasing cycle, right? That like from lead coming in to converting, do you think better bot is on the front end of that or the back end of that? Cause when you say there's good sources and bad sources, I could imagine that Maybe there's a source that sends a lot of traffic, but they're not ready for a better bot or they're past a better bot, depending on what your answer is, right? Where um, they just want to, they want to talk to a human and not, not a, not a bot. So I'm just curious what you see from a typical customer uh, journey, if you will, like uh, that. And then when, how long it takes them usually to convert after working with a bot. Uh, you're right. We see an average of 30, 32 days seems to be right around the same amount. I mean, so we see 30, 30, 35. Um, in terms of being ahead or behind, the reality is people just, a different way to look at it is to say one information. We're at the tip of the funnel today. So when I'm first coming in and looking at, uh, and I'm looking at Google My Business. Well, you know, that's, that's, where, that's where we live on the property website. So we're at the tip of the marketing funnel. We are moving slowly into a further end, so text interactions and email interactions. Um, so that's where we live and want to work with companies who are further in, like yourself or maybe a CRM. Um, so, so that's where we, we hand that off. Um, again, people just want information. And they want it now, 24-7, 365, and they want what they want. What they don't want to do is fill out a lead form. Um, they don't want to wait till tomorrow. So these are things that are not changing anytime soon. And this is why bots just kind of fit today's consumer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered all of your questions. Well, I was that, trying to... that was pretty helpful. Um, to, uh, sorry, I thought, thought I lost you guys for a second. That was pretty helpful. The, um, I guess, how about this? How often, if you get 100 visitors to the website, how many of those visitors might use a, a better bot? 
tile. So let's talk about that a little bit of the, the funnel. Um, the, the person coming in often looks and then this usually the second time that they're going through the site, they'll click the bot because the bot says, hey, I can help with this specific thing. Maybe it's scheduling an appointment. Maybe it's something I can't find on a big website. The bot just happens to have that there. Um, so of the every 100, we have approximately 13 of them unique. So of 100 uniques, we have a 13 unique people that will come in and use the bot. Uh, let me come at this a different way. Per property per month, when we distribute the bot, uh, we will see an average of 200 unique renter conversations every month, uh, answering about 150 questions to those folks. Um, now, what I tell people, sometimes the, the best uh, renter is the one you never talk to because it just doesn't fit. So the bot's actually looking through these conversations and helping the renter know that this may or may not be the place. We then usually see about 26 handoffs per property per month, 13 or half of those are appointments. Now here's what's really interesting. When you look at the appointments that a call center is generating, they have a 50% show rate. Half the time they don't show up. There's a reason for that. 65% of the time they show up when a property schedules it. When our bot schedules it, 90% of the time they show up. Why? Because we didn't ask any information up front. We allowed them to self-select and reschedule whenever they want. And there was no pressure. So the bot said, hey, if you want to give us your information, great. If you don't, no problem. When you want to schedule or reschedule, have at it. So you usually see a self-selection of a 90, technically it's 92% show rate. Uh, and, and so that, and we participate in about four leases per property per month and save the average property 80 hours of human labor. Uh, so that's roughly four. Hundred to eighteen hundred dollars, depending on how much um, you pay a leasing agent. Yeah, well, that's super, super interesting. Some great. There's stuff. a bunch of data for you. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, Reed, I'll pass back you. Well, I, I'm curious about the qualification of the. So you clearly are producing super qualified traffic, meaning that they're they're there, you know, with intent. Um, one of the challenges we face, a lot of people, uh, well, our competitors is. Um, getting getting to uh, the more qualified traffic with the also, but also adhering, of course, to fair housing laws, things like that. So, yeah. I didn't know uh, how you guys are approaching that. If I get on, you know, the spot, um, I I may have a high intent, but also not be, you know, a qualified, uh, you know, candidate. So, is that something that uh, you know has has been an active conversation, a challenge, or is it just kind of is what it is? Well, uh, one thing with fair housing, by the way, um, interestingly enough. Another many reason we got away from NLP is NLP can fall into a fair housing violations. Um, you can have the best NLP in the world and it can still run risk. And that is not a place you want to have an NLP bot that can run that risk um, on your website representing your product where you have fair housing laws that are so strict. So let me just say another reason for NLP, not today. Um, and but what was the other the other part of that was the. Just if, uh, you know, many of the folks that, that do show up, I guess, for, for tours um, or schedule, if they're, oh. if they're qualified, yeah. Um, yeah. again, they clearly have the intent, which is great, but I didn't know if uh, you guys were running into much of that. Um, I mean, it, you, you qualify in the sense that it asks what your budget is, um, and it gives you your search results and availability, and it lists us when you're looking, at, looking to move. So it's going through all that process, much like a website would. Um, but it's um, doing it in a quick and non-intrusive way. It's collecting the information. So if you still come in after you clearly do not qualify on any level and there's no availability, well, that's just a, not a very smart shopper. Right. Um, but it's going through the process and looking to see if you do. And that's why we say a lot of people say, oh, well, they're not converting the leads. Some, some of these, some of the time they're like, how come they're not? And the answer is because they don't fit. Look what they're selecting. You don't have availability. You're not in their price range. <laughs> Um, so why would they come to you? You don't want them. They're wasting your time and they're gumming up your CRM. You only want the stuff that's good and high value coming in. Uh, so I will say it's interesting. You get a bunch of leads come through to in, in, in yesterday's world. A lot of the times, let's be honest, the, the leasing agents are like, oh gosh, 78 more leads I just saw come in when I walk in today. Mm -hmm. Well, when BetterBot first started, they noticed that these were actual conversations. It wasn't a stock standard thing coming through. It was, and you could see the whole conversation that it was having and asking a unique question. Person says, hey, I'd like to come in for a tour, but I have a 52 Corvette. It's the actual one that happened. 52 Corvette, I just refurbished it, and I want to know if you have covered parking spot for it to come in. That's a great conversation, and a person who's very interested, 
So what we noticed is this Pavlovian response where our leads, our conversational leads are starting to come to the top of the pile of response because they go, wow, these people have had conversations. They're kind of ready to buy. So they started responding to our leads much faster than kind of your standard stuff coming through other sources. Yeah, totally. Makes sense. Um, I'm going to come back a little bit to the regional ILS opportunity uh, and just again to remind people we're talking about, you know, PM companies that have high concentration in different neighborhoods and, you know, are trying to to pool their resources together and operate a little bit more as a mini ILS. Um, what do you think about this idea? Uh, if you were to go to your old stomping grounds apartment guide, um, or your old company, I should say, or even, you know, a co-star today, they, they wouldn't probably take the call. And I'm not saying, I mean, if you were like, Hey, let me throw, you know, better bot on top of your whole platform. It's like, well, that's not going to go over well, but it seems to me could be a pretty amazing experience. If these guys were receptive to it as if you actually had neighborhood bots within the ILSs. So if it's been identified that I'm interested in Dave and I know, you know, Colorado, so I have to use that example, but that I'm interested in Rhino as a place to live. If a, you know, bot at that point intercepted me that was programmed and prepared, because you mentioned that one of the biggest differences between Google and what you have is it's trained for multifamily. Taking that a step further is if you have bots that are actually trained for specific neighborhoods, you know, where they're able to provide more information than just the property itself, but actually give you insights about, you know, the location, the area that you're exploring. And then you have people buying into those neighborhood bots on the ILS um, so that they have a chance to be considered. Um, so you have these kind of sister properties and then you're getting closer to that Frankenstein or personal assistant. But now it knows more than just properties. It actually knows neighborhoods. So long, I, I love that. I love this whole premise um, and, and we're, we're definitely in alignment on this. Back when we built out realestate.com 2000, gosh, four, we ended up selling out to Barry Diller at Lending Tree back in the day. Um, what we realized when we were building out that model was the MLSs had the power, but the, they really didn't. The brokers all had the power. The brokers have the content. So the model that we were building at the time was broker direct. We bypassed the MLSs altogether. We just consolidated all the biggest brokers in the market and handed the leads right back to them. And it was such a forward thinking model that Lending Tree came in and saw this as such a major threat that they offered our, our parent company ridiculous uh, multiples to buy it out of our hands because they didn't want us competing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a funny thing what you just said. The, the ILSs do not have the power only because they're the one consolidator. Um, the content owners are the property management companies, the owner companies. They have the power. They have the content. Once they kind of realize that they can do that and they can market their own content in unique and special and regionalized ways, you have a very different model on your hands. And one of the reasons, and I have been approached from various ILSs to come back into the fold, my answer is no. It serves a purpose, certainly, as content aggregators. They're never going to go away entirely, but they've got to be very careful that they're not that they're not forcing 12 month contracts and playing heavy handedness because we're at a we're at a critical stage right now. We're at the precipice of the content and flipping the script where the power is going to end up back in the hands of the uh, of the property management company sooner than than people realize. And if we can participate and play in that and help pro propel that um, and, and while bringing the ILSs to the table. Um, and, and helping them be participant in that. So they can either fight it, but they can participate in that. Uh, yeah. but, but you're right. The power is going to be back in the hands eventually of the property management companies one way or another with, kind of with these new technologies. Well, you you clearly have a lot of really cool things uh, ahead of you. And, um, you know, I'm just making the parallel with David and I, you know, talking about our business and our technology. Um, and so I'm going to ask you this question as, you know, I guess, founder to founder, but somebody walks up to you and, and offers you a check for a hundred million dollars. Are you going to, you know, thanks so much. And, and it's over or are you, uh, and I'm exaggerating Robert, but you know, or That's is right. it like, I want to do this kind of no yeah. matter what for a few years, then I'll look up and, and see if somebody's interested. Um, and you obviously don't have to share if you don't want to. Uh, sure. I'll share. Um, and it depends on who's answering that question. If it's me or my wife, <laughs> you can get two very different answers. Yeah. Uh, no, you were definitely selling. Um, the way I look at this is 
we are having fun. We are affecting change. We are growing. We're providing solutions. As long as we continue to do that and we're enjoying it, providing value, I'm not interested in, in selling something just to sell it. The day that I think we've done as much as we can do and it's beyond what my capabilities are, because look, I'm a startup, an early stage guy. I'm not a guy designed to build. I've managed big companies. I don't like managing big companies and big groups. Mm -hmm. So I think once we get to that place, I think it would make sense to be a handoff mm -hmm. to somebody who is better equipped to manage a larger company. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. We probably won't be for a couple of years, two or three years. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, yeah, we'll just keep having fun and providing value when the time's right. Well, then maybe and we'll know you guys know the same thing i mean you know you're having fun you guys are doing great work mm -hmm. um you're making a name for yourself in the industry and and there's going to be a day when you think okay you know i think it's time now it's not me yeah. and it probably won't be for two or three years at least what Very about cool. you <laughs> did you have you gotta answer that question i'll pass that hot potato to david <laughs> well reed and i talk about this pretty openly uh with the the team and even on the on the podcast at times but um, for us, it, it, like we think a lot about like mission and why, like a lot of the si Simon Sinek um, style stuff. Uh, and re one of read the biggest thing when we started Digital was affecting change. So the words you just used, super important. Uh, we also though have probably added happiness in there. So that is one of our core values, but has become really important for our employees. So happiness for us, but also happiness for our employees. And that has really started to move into more move beyond business stuff. So we're doing a lot of things internally to make employees happy well beyond what we have to do uh, because it brings us great satisfaction to help them uh, get like their personal personal growth and development outside of their career. So um, we've we've gone back and forth a lot because we've certainly had people approach us, but it you know it hasn't felt right, like the timing. but also we question like I just said to read last week, uh, like, man, we've got like six really cool products that we could launch an entire company around that we're, mm. that we're currently mm -hmm. developing. And my biggest, I guess, friction point right now is when, how do we treat those? Like, do we, cause I know other folks that would take just one of these six and turn it into an entire company. Uh, but yet we want to do it internally because we like the innovation. We like how it flexes our creativity and it's just fun and motivating. Uh, so how long do we keep those in the fold or what's our strategy? Because if we, we're only four years old, if, we, if we're if we six, seven, 10 years old, we might have a portfolio of 30 products, right? And now what do we do? Because it's like you really lose focus. Reed has talked about like, well, when our current, some of our current products, we'd sunset some of those, right? To focus on the new ones. But I don't know that that's realistic because we have 13 products right now, uh, but it's not like we're going to sunset Google all of a sudden it's like Google's not going anywhere. Right. right. So a lot of these things I think have like four or five years worth of, of legs. On them. And we're trying to figure out, are we like an incubator that starts builds these things and spends them off? Or do we just keep them internally? And we just don't give it as much effort because we have so many new ones as we would if it was our entire company. So back to your thing, uh, if someone approaches tomorrow, we're not, we're not selling um, mostly because we're getting to build hitting that mission of like, we're affecting change, but we're also hitting our core value of happiness in freedom. And Reed and I have no interest if we were to sell to ever have to work for anybody else. And I was telling Reed, like, if we had to start over and go open another bank account and file new incorporation paperwork, like, man, that is a mountain to climb, like to do all that small uh, crap that you forget about. Um, so yeah. I think we'd rather keep uh, digital, uh, but keep innovating. But now we got to figure out what we do with all these ideas. Yeah, we use and I, I so two things: greedy's heuristic model, basically, you know, what's the what's the tangentially the closest to what we do that can get you some revenue. So we, like you, I mean, our our heads are filled with all sorts of things we want to do, but you got to stay focused. I love your happiness scale, your happiness quotient, um, and, and to me, as a, also as a as a co-founder, um, I asked about three months ago, three heads of our departments. And I said, what do you describe our company? Because it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what they think. They're the ones that actually own the, the, the feeling around it. And the most heartwarming part for me was in all three of them independently and separated and separately said, I think we're like a family. I mean, I don't just think of it as a better bot. I think it's a better company. And I feel very much like a family. Now, that says, that's maybe a little kumbaya and touchy-feely. But I mean, come on. When you're having people... We're running various departments in your company and people in your company who feel that way. 
you're doing something right. And, and to me, business is less than half of it. It's the people you're working with and what they're getting away that really makes the difference. And, and, and that's why I love working with this type of style of company, the size of company, your type of company. I think we share these philosophies. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you were giving out the better pot to your employees there before you asked that question. <laughs> better pot. We're going to revisit that, Reed. We're going to make 100%. that up. Uh, We already know what the next business will be. There you I go. hope we're in a state of mind that we can incorporate, right? <laughs> That's like, funny. That's funny. Well, um, I, I, oh, go ahead, Reed. Well, Sorry, I, I, I promised that I wouldn't do, t and I think I behaved myself as far as, you know, asking him about his past with apartment guy. But this isn't as much about your past, Robert, as it is just your general thoughts on, uh, you know, the failed attempt, I guess, by Go uh, CoStar uh, to acquire apartment guide or rent path. And um, if you thought that would have been good for the industry, bad for the industry, and when we talk to people now about ILSs, and, and a lot of times they're talking to us, you know, um, there's two sides of this. One is consolidation is actually a good thing because it was getting out of hand and I can't afford to spread myself onto 20 different ILSs. And then there's other people that say this is a problem, you know, you know, kind of antitrust, like, you know, we don't want to see CoStar become a monopoly and completely like basically hold us hostage, um, whether it's contracts or, um, you know, data, et cetera. So, you know, it seems like somewhere in between is probably the best for the industry, but what are your thoughts on uh, what happened there with RentPath? Well, this is a loaded question. Uh, I could see from an outside perspective and an administration looking at why this might be an antitrust issue. However, I don't think it is. When you look at rent.com, sold for $440 million. Uh, today, could you sell it for a fraction of that? No, why? The value isn't there as much. You, you had le you had all these proliferation, and now you're having consolidation. If ILSs uh, were the only way that we could market, and they bought up all these, yes, we'd have a, a serious issue. It's not. We have companies like yours that are finding unique and much better and, and higher value uh, ways of getting and attracting the renter. Companies like ours that are participating in that. There are new technologies. So I personally would love for them to be able to come in and buy that. I hope they consolidate every one of them because something's going to happen when that happens. It's going to force the industry into thinking in entirely different ways and adopting different technologies. And that fosters innovation and new technologies like yours and like ours. So honestly, I was kind of rooting for it and, yeah. and hopefully maybe it still happens, but I'm okay either way. Yeah. Super interesting and uh, perspective. I agree with a lot of what you said. The bomb that w w David and I are kind of waiting, uh, not anticipating in a, you know, but just that that could go off and change things forever for the ILS is if Google uh, enters the picture the way they did, you know, with uh, hotels and suddenly they offer their own ILS, then where does that leave, you know, a co-star? And that seems eminent to, to David and I, and we know some people uh, that sounds, you know, like some sort of... <laughs> I feel like that was a Will Ferrell quote. We know some people. Um, but be on the lookout for that. Uh, I want to back up, though, like, and and ask you another question, because having been in radio, both of us spent some time there. Um, they said that radio missed uh, its biggest opportunity, which was to create Groupon. Um, they had daily deals before anybody else did out of the major media companies. And this is true. And I learned some of this just, you know, through kind of, my own uh, onboarding uh, when I was <clears throat> up at CBS in Seattle, um, but they they didn't digitize it. They they didn't do the the, the group model, um, obviously that Groupon built, and obviously Groupon's had serious ups and downs itself. But my question in that is, what what did the ILS, as you say, that the value is not there anymore? Where did they miss? Was there a clear thing that they should have done or pivoted to? And I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, one would be, should they have gotten into digital media, you know, sooner? Um, some of them are still trying to, to enter that space, meaning doing what Digible does and, you know, offering Google instead of just their own products. And, and they kept expanding and creating this massive bloated rate card. You know, why not start competing with digital agencies? Um, so that's one thing that maybe they missed out on um, that now it's kind of too late for them to, to try and uh, capture. And then another would be the business model itself. Dave and I had an episode where we played, you know, ILS founders. And we said, you know, if we were developing an ILS today, what would it look like? 
And one of the first things that I've gone to for some time is the auction based cost model. You know, it seems so antiquated to me, you know, to, to have the static like, you know, here's a gold package that you pay a flat fee for. You may be leased up, you may not be, but no matter what, you're going to pay that, you know, whatever, 700, 800 bucks a month. And so a lot of the late, later ILSs, and I'll use apartment lists, which you mentioned, uh, I forgot which company you said they bought, but they have the pay per lease and, you know, that that's gone very well for them, you know, and I saw they just had another huge raise. Um, so people like the performance-based model, but the Google is the gold standard here as far as the cost model. They've they created a, a performance-based in kind of let's just call it an engagement platform or cost model. I'm not trying to lead you too much. I'm just giving you two examples of things that seem like it could have changed the ILS like picture in a big way is if they had opened themselves up more to that idea of a different cost model, or if they had you know leaned into digital advertising instead of like trying to fight it. So what, uh, do you have any thoughts here? Oh, wow. Uh, a lot, but I'll, I'll, let's just, I'll, <laughs> um, I, I think I do like the, the, the Google model. Um, if I, if I was running an ILS today, uh, the Google, I don't think is going to replace the ILSs. Um, I don't think they'll become, let me, let me say that differently. I don't think they'll become an ILS. They're going to stay Google. Um, which is good because it levels the playing field a little bit against the ILSs. Uh, the, 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 so if I was going to go back into the ILS model, and part of the reason why I don't want to is I don't have the perfect idea for that. Um, it is challenging. And those look, I sat in their seat. They're trying to reinvent themselves. It's not easy to do. Um, I personally blame, and this I get in trouble for saying this, so I don't know how many people listen to your podcast, but I may get in trouble for this. You know who's at fault for the whole paper lead models and all these things and first lead attribution? Property management companies. Why? Because they said, well, I don't want to pay you unless I get a unless I get a, a lease. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, um, how do we track that? Well, if you're the first lead, okay, so you want me to shove as many leads as fast as I can, regardless of quality, in your CRM and timestamp it. And then if they happen to lease, then I get paid. Yeah, that's it. That's a terrible model. Um, the, why I like a convergence of an ad-based model with an ILS is, it, and this is where I think your company could play a, a huge role in this. We all know that they touch multiple sources. So if I know that one renter, well, let's say 100 renters came through a certain path and 38% of the time it was here and 28% of the time it was there, then I look at the value-based model. And I can do and say, okay, well, I'm going to pay this ILS X dollars a month because they got me this value. So I think the power needs to come in people like yourself, where you can paint a picture and change this whole model around first lead attribution and paper leads. I don't like it. Um, it's wrought with error and, 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 and issue. That's where I kind of get into this, this, this cost versus value model of, um, you know, and I do like your auctioneering. Um, but we've got to get away with this, this, this whole standardized uh, set monthly, 12-month contract. Uh, paper lease. I think that we need to look at the renter journey when we can solve that and start to understand what value a certain source is bringing or not bringing, and then making uh, decisions around that. Now, I don't have the math behind that yet. I have not seen enough data, but I know if I'm running an ILS and I represent 52% of the touches and the value coming through using some algorithm, I I'm command a certain amount of money. Same thing with Google. I'm going to pay $1.50 a click if it's going to convert well, but I'm going to pay $0.18 cents if it's not. So there's a convergence in here somewhere, and I don't have the answer for that. But I think companies like yourself are going to be playing a pivotal role as we change that over these next couple of years. Yeah. Well, I know Dave is very much you know, on board with the value-based approach um, really to all of our products, but just the way we think about you know doing business. Um, and that is what you, you just – you said it for me, but the Google example – you know, the businesses decide the value, not not Google. And that's that's a, such a simple thing for me. Like, you know, if I'm an ILS, it's like, why don't we let them determine? And maybe it's because they're scared that there's no value there or who knows. But um, I think if you gave it time, uh, took the right approach, that 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 could be a big disruption. One thing I do want to uh, briefly, uh, I guess, touch on that you said is you didn't think Google would replace the ILS. I'll agree with you on that one. But when you book a hotel now, and maybe you'll surprise me, how do you do it? Um, 
do you go to hotels.com or do you search like let's say you were wanting to go somewhere in napa you know you go to google and now you have this amazing experience google reviews built in all this stuff before you ever even see you know hotels.com and I, I don't know what the percentages are right now, and that's what I'd be curious to see. I, I agree they won't become an ILS or completely replace the ILSs, I guess, but I could see that experience very much going the same direction, in which case, um, you know, that could be an exodus for advertisers on on the ILSs. Um, so I do, to answer your question, I actually do go to Hotels.com. Uh, if I'm looking at a, <laughs> I, I go to TripAdvisor, Expedia. If I'm buying food, I go to Uber Eats or DoorDash. So I know kind of where to go, but part of that's because they've done a really good job with their loyalty programs and their branding, which is expensive. It's very expensive. And so they built that brand. Obviously, uh, yeah, I go to Google for certain things, but if I'm searching for apartments in a particular area in today's world, it's not actually very friendly. If I type in apartments in Atlanta, blah, 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 um, and I get search results, it's kind of all over their Google Maps. And so it's not doing a shop and compare format, any of that. So this is why... I just don't see them ever being an aggregator of a real uh, sort in multifamily. Um, I do see them providing unique and specific content on brands, properties, and things like that. Because I will Google and I'll look at a couple in a certain area. Um, but I just don't see them replacing ILSs. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, of course, Google probably wouldn't be too excited about losing apartments.com as a $150 million a year client now. <laughs> well, yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah. yeah. David. Robert, the um going back for a second on the powers in the hands of the content, you're right. Like Google, uh, nobody has to agree to put their content on Google. Google just go, goes and gets it, right? Unless you try to stop Google, which nobody does because they want the Google traffic. Apartment.com right. and the like, they don't really take that same approach, right? They, because they've gotten enough scale, as Reed was saying about network effects, like because like all everyone's competitor is on there, they feel like they have to be on there too. So it's very much a, a group think mentality. So would you just dive a little bit more into that whole, like the, the content owner is really king here, right? Because uh, what I'm guessing is you were saying, if nobody decided to list on apartments.com, apartments.com has very little value now, right? Because they don't have any listings. It's kind of like when, the, when uh, apartments.com goes up against Graystar and it like removes all Graystar free listings. And it's like, well, you're not going to be there. But if they did that to too many people at the same time, Apartments.com loses a lot of its a lot of its value proposition, right? So they have to be selective with that. So could you just go into that more? Your your theory about the content owner being king, because if if the the peasants realize that they really have the power and not not the king, then the dynamic changes. But you have to depend on the other peasants, right? It's kind of like the whole game, GameStop thing. It's like oh, let's all buy GameStop stock. But as soon as the people start exiting, it's a problem. So yeah, just unpack that a bit more. Oh, well, I mean, I think you actually, I think you described it very well. Um, I don't know that I can add much more than that. Um, it is going to take someone or some technology who is going to help consolidate that content, that thinking, that rationale that will enable management companies to work together such that they don't need the bigger ILSs, and that is what the ILSs are relying or hoping that doesn't happen. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, again, I don't think I have much more to add, but um, I would like to get into, and I can't, <laughs> but I'm hesitating. I'd like to get into why I think how you can really do that, but I'd be giving away the the secret sauce that we're the Frankenstein, and so I can't dive too much into that right now. Um, but I suffice it to say, um, there are technologies coming down the pipe that are going to level the playing field and enable and flip the script where property management companies will have more of the power than they do today. That's the best way I can put that. Wow. Well, I can't wait to try to bend your ear offline, but um, we'll, we'll talk. I want you guys to play a role in it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I do think Absolutely. Reed's idea about the ILS of the apartment list could work. You're already friendly with them, right? But um, the apartment list, since they're charging by lead, you could effectively drop your bot or help them in a way, like help get people to purchase from one of their properties, right? Yeah. So here's the challenge, right? This is what's happening. And now we're talking about the ILSs are frustrated because they're sending all these leads to property management companies. They're saying, we're sending you great stuff. Property management companies are saying, they're not converting. You guys are killing us with all these leads. We are responding. 
And the ILS says, well, you're doing automated responses, not people. And like, we don't have the people to manage all this. Do you need to do a better job of filtering? So there's this back and forth that keeps happening between these two. We're like, hold it, time out. <laughs> Let stop making humans be bots and automatically responding. Because CRMs, by the way, are just lead repositories. They're not actually doing the work here. Let's use some automation technology. Let's allow the, the bot to respond to those leads and say, hey, I forwarded this to my human friends, but I can help you right now. Would you like to explore the neighborhood, schedule an appointment? Let's take that asynchronous email back and forth out of the picture and turn it into a synchronous conversational bot conversation, separate the tire kickers from the real prospects, and then funnel that to the right place. Now we've removed out of all of this stuff and given consumers the information they want at their fingertips. So this is one way. And by the way, the ILSs um, are very interested in this. They want this because their their contention is we're sending you good stuff. You're not replying. So they are ready for us to come out with this because they know that we're going to prove in their minds that we're sending more than you thought. Not, and the property management companies are saying, great, we hope it does show that because that means we're getting better value and, and so forth. That's just one example of, uh, you know, of using this automation technology with the ILSs and web sources. Well, and, uh, that. as we start to wrap up, I'm going to let hit one last topic here. Um, I, well, I don't know another bot company I would go to if I was going to go to a bot company right now in apartments, but you guys are competing with all of these different other widgets, website widgets. I know you guys have a great blog post. I like to reference about like the website, Las Vegas. So why don't you talk mm -hmm. us through your biggest objection and objections that you hit? Uh, and then when, I don't know if you want to say when something like a better bot's a good fit versus not a good fit. And I mm -hmm. guess I'm assuming you're going to hit some of these others, like the knock and the perk and the whatever, like we've got all these great tools, rent grata. So now what do I do? Like, so uh, I'll just wind you up and let you go for a minute. Yeah. So it's funny. There's some competitors that are competitors, some competitors that are not. I'll use Rent Grata. I love the guys over at Rent Grata. Super young guys doing great work, uh, trying to, you know, doing a wonderful job bringing their product to the marketplace. And we end up competing with them. I talked to Zach the other day and we don't do the same thing. We're not even remotely close, but we're competing for, for real estate space on the website. And so you're seeing all these widgets. So I say, is your site looking like Las Vegas? All these widgets. Now, at BetterBot, we can either be part of the problem, yet another widget, or we can be part of the solution. So I reached out to Rent Grotta and said, hey, I think there's a way that we can converge our two products where we can bake your process into ours and let people know in the bot, call out and go, hi, I can connect you to a renter. So you're not losing your product. You're actually baked into the bot process. On a website that they're, you know, that that's okay to converge that, and they feel maybe they're losing a little space because they could be on the left. But my point to them was, when you go out to Yelp and Google and all these other places where the bot lives, it's taking you with them out there where you don't have exposure. So let's build this together. Um, some of it's average, like Perk. We're the exact opposite of Perk. Perk is a lead generation. Um, product. We're, we're the opposite. We actually don't want to send you more leads. We actually want to manage and convert the traffic and leads you already have into higher value. I'm not saying one's right or wrong, and I'm not saying good or bad. I'm saying we're very different. Um, Middle East is another great example. So we run into, there's this perception that we compete with some products that we actually partner with. We partnered with these folks. Um, our goal is that we partner with everybody we can, and we help be ubiquitous and facilitate to wherever the consumer wants to go. If your consumer wants to see your sitemap, let's have it in the bot. If you have self-guided integrations or self-guided tours, let's put it, build it in the bot. And if you want people to talk to renters, let's build it in the bot. Let the bot be the digital agent who's referring you to the content the consumers want. The consumer drives the conversation. We simply want to follow that. Yeah, well, that's terrific. And I think uh, you know how Reed always talks about universal adapter. I think that's the way to go and to be friendly yeah. with all, all people. Um, quick clarifying question. Uh, how much does it mess you guys up when when they redo their website and don't tell you about it? Like, <laughs> like if you change a page or a link or whatever, does that just break you guys? It did early on a couple of years ago when we first launched it. Like, where'd the bot go? Oh, they updated their site and dropped the link. And so we we're like, oh, that's not going to do well. So we actually built in all these flags. Um, so the system says, if no activity over a certain period of time, flag, alert, 
and then we'll let them know. So we've got pretty darn good because honestly, if you get a whole month later and there's no data, yikes, even though it wasn't our fault, it didn't do anything for you. So it's in our best interest to help them. We also talk to clients about optimizing, you know, get rid of some of these widgets, combine some widgets, uh, put the bot over here, not there. So look, at the end of the day, if, if we aren't doing a great job coaching the client on how to optimize our product, leaving it up to the client, our results are not going to be as good. Uh, but yes, that's happened before. Uh, we've gotten pretty good at mitigating that, though. Well, I would also think with, I imagine you guys do some sort of deep linking or something. So you mentioned sitemap. So if you try to link someone to a particular page, but it's moved, that would be a problem. Or if you're pulling in an image from a different page, like a floor plan image, but then that's moved or something. It's like, I can only imagine the headache that would all create. Well, look, the, as you know, and as you're alluding to, when you start, no good deed goes unpunished, right? So, hey, look, we've got a ma maps. Uh oh, they just changed it. So the, when you introduce one thing, it's not one more complexity, it's five times more complex. And so people, one thing that we get off and better about is, wow, your bot seems so simple, almost as if that's not a good thing. And the answer is, do you know how much work goes into making it that simple and easy to use? And, and that map popping up and the, and, and the appointments popping up, it may look simple and easy, but there's so much going on behind the scenes. And you're right. So we have to build out a lot of flags and a lot of alerts to let us know every time something goes wrong and it's in, you know, and we need to let the client know. So, but hey, you know what you're getting into. I mean, we knew that. And, and every time we launch a new product, our engineering team and product teams, as you can see, I'm, oh no, here we go again. Yeah. Reed and I talk about that all the time, like things being so simple and they're so much harder. And then how do you extract the value or make people understand the value? So that's a whole nother topic. Um, yeah. Well, I know we've Absolutely. gone uh, long here, but Reed, do you have any other burning questions uh, before we wrap? I'm going to save them. I, I don't think this will be our first conversation with Robert on the on the Digital Dudes. So uh, I'll save like it. for part two. Awesome. Great questions, guys. Honestly, I'm not just saying it's been one of the most fun I have had in a long time talking about this. It's actually exceeded my expectations. So um, I really appreciate you having me on. And uh, we, we've thoroughly loved working with you guys. And uh, I know that we will be for the next few years. I'm bringing this stuff to the marketplace. Well, thanks, Robert. Well, yeah, this was a blast. And I, I know we had you at the uh, our conference, Digital Summit, last um, fall. And uh, I know we'll probably want to have you on another episode to just get your thoughts. So thank you for being so open and for taking the time. You bet. Thanks, guys. Thank you.